Okay. Looks like we're recording. Yes. Yay. So we have a playlist for every one of our webinars. Today's playlist um, was crowdsourced by our wonderful speakers and moderator. We also um, found one of the speakers, Alex, actually shared a playlist of over 300 surveillance-oriented um, songs. So we will be sharing that link in the chat. Um, you cannot have too many surveillance-oriented songs in your playlist. And please, please check out our next webinar. Um, I think Kelly will drop the link in the chat so you can quickly register if you'd like. Um, focusing on the United States and PrEP equity, or in the case of the United States, there's a lot of PrEP inequity. We're going to be addressing that with our amazing speakers for this webinar and talking about ways to address that and be successful with our PrEP rollout. So without further ado, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn this over to our wonderful moderator, Nana, who will introduce herself and our speakers and take us through the next uh, almost hour and a half. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Nana, over to you. Great. Greetings, everybody. I'm Nana Kana. Um, I use they or she pronouns. I'm an independent consultant and strategist and also the founding executive director of Positive Women's Network USA. Um, I am joining you today from occupied Ohlone land, uh, colonially known as Oakland, California in the United States. And um, I will be your moderator today. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you to the Choice Agenda for bringing us together for this really important conversation. Um, as you probably know, today we are going to hear from leaders in digital technology, HIV privacy issues, and criminalization of sexual and reproductive freedom to really examine the existential, existential threat that faces our communities today in terms of ongoing blurred boundaries between policing and public health. Um, Unfortunately, we live in a society where often our responses to um, health issues are to surveil and police them rather to, than to respond um, in ways that are compassionate and uphold human rights. And so we see these tensions continuing to emerge. Um, and particularly today, we'll be looking at the intersections of surveillance and criminalization of public health in two specific areas, HIV and reproductive health care, um, and considering how a lot of different social and structural factors and forms of violence intersect with those, um, where there are some overlaps, where there's some trends, uh, what data collection looks like, um, what consent means, what privacy means today, and um, how you know, what shared demands can look like to really protect bodily autonomy, human rights, and freedom. And so um, we, we will be in conversation about, you know, looking at human rights and public health. Are these at odds? Who decides when it's acceptable to compromise our human rights and why are they doing that? Um, whose rights tend to be compromised? And we know that this, this conversation has never been more important in this era of rising global fascism and authoritarianism, rising surveillance, um, rapidly creeping and growing surveillance that shows up in so many different ways from, you know, the way our phones are tracking us to the way our online activities and research are um, tracked, data is collected on them to, um, to cameras that are everywhere, um, really looking at how these um, these rising trends in surveillance intersect with policing, intersect with criminalization, and um, really ultimately undermine human rights and autonomy, bodily autonomy. Um, and so, we welcome your questions and comments. As um, you know, as Jim said, please do use the raise hands feature to let us know when you want to come off mute to ask a question. Please also throughout this conversation use the. Um, the Q and A function and the chat box to, um, you know, to write in your comments and questions. And so um, today we're really going to hear from three amazing experts in these fields. Um, first, starting with Alan Maleche, who's the executive director of Kenya Legal and Ethical Issues Network on HIV and AIDS, or Kellyn. 
Um, then we're going to hear from Alex McClelland, the assistant professor at the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Carleton University in Canada. Um, and finally, we'll hear from Arnita Rogers, executive director at the Center for Reproductive Rights and Justice, Courage, at, um, at UC Berkeley. And so um, I think with that, I'm going to invite Alan Maleche to open us up today. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. And I did enjoy the playlist. I just want to start off by saying this is a very uh, timely conversations and greetings from Nairobi. I just want to say that I want to start off by talking about the importance of the use of digital technologies and artificial intelligence in healthcare is very important because it has the potential of helping us improve access to better health outcomes, create a more resilient healthcare system, and even sometimes an equitable one. And so we've seen the use of technologies, especially in the field of HIV and in the field of reproductive health, that is geared towards making things better. For instance, we've seen the use of mobile-based platforms to encourage uh, people through SMS messages to adhere to their PrEP adherence. We have seen uh, pilot projects that seek to work closely with pregnant women to be able to access their services in a more timely manner in order to ensure that if there are any complications with regards to the birth of the child that's taken care of. But coming with all these advancements of the use of digital technology and artificial intelligence comes in with the risk of violation of human rights, there's a risk of ethical breach of people's uh, beliefs and practices. And so the challenge we face is around how do we draw the balance between promoting the use of digital innovation or technology to improve access to information while balancing between the risks that are posed. And some of the risks that are posed, the most popular one is privacy breaches. And just as we heard from the theme song, the surveillance or monitoring of people, because someone is tracking the data that is being collected. And again, the danger of what we call function creep, that that data may be used for something that it is not intended to have been used for. And recently, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health released a report indicating that there is a risk of use of digital data and digital technologies in a way that would affect people's rights, but also in a way that would perpetuate racism, sexism, uh, albinism, or even having people discriminated on the basis of their sexual or gender identity. And so we have to keep in mind that it gets to us for people living with HIV, particularly sex workers, people who inject drugs, prisoners, transgender, or gay men, and other men who have sex with men, because then the breach of data makes them more vulnerable to criminalization, makes them more vulnerable to stigma and violence. So we really have to think through with the dangers that lack, what are the safeguards that we need to put into place? And I would submit that safeguarding data is important because the data that is given in trust by various vulnerable and marginalized groups needs to be safeguarded to avoid any form of mistrust. We have witnessed this in Kenya where certain donors wanted to introduce the collection of biometric information of key populations as a way of getting the numbers and trying to track where they are and how they can get treatment to them. But without the involvement and consultation of these affected communities, it proved to be very difficult to get their buy-in in terms of taking this particular process forward. So I think it's important for us to think through if we are taking up any technologies, how well have we involved those who want to use it? Have we talked to young women? Have we talked to young people? Have we talked to the people living with HIV to say, this is the technology I want to take forward. What are your thoughts? 
how does it affect you? What legal safeguards have we put into place as the donors, as the government, as private sector, as even people who are involved in the judiciary, what safeguards have been put into place to ensure that people's rights are protected, people are protected from discrimination, people are protected in terms of enjoying their right to privacy. And looking at the fact that many groups in the HIV world are criminalized, that makes it even more difficult for them to want to be able to share their information. So it's important for us in this field of HIV and reproductive health, and those of us generally also in the field of digital health, digital rights, and dealing with issues of innovations to ask ourselves the questions of, is this technology accessible to the people that need it? Is it acceptable? Because is it putting them at risk? Is it not putting at risk? And then is it available? Because you may be introducing technologies that may not be easily available to people who need it because A, they may not be able to afford phones, they may not be able to access data, they may not have access to electricity, and that even makes it more worse because you're marginalizing them from being able to take this forward. So I think I want to conclude by saying that we really have to appreciate that yes, there are positive things that digital technologies bring, but we have to think through how do we embrace the positiveness that they bring on board to enhance access to healthcare to the most manageable, man marginalized groups? But also, how do we ensure that the risks that they pose, those risks are particularly mitigated? And it's important to know that everyone has a role, whether you're a donor, whether you're a private sector person, whether you're a government uh, representative, whether you're from civil society, ask yourself the question, what role do I have to do to minimize the risk that technology brings, particularly to marginalized and vulnerable communities? I look forward to more discussions, but just wanted to lay out that particular framework and say that indeed we welcome digital technologies, but we have to consider what is it we can do to mitigate the risks that come with the digital technologies because we have seen those risks and we have seen communities suffer as a result of breach of privacy, function creep of their data, and being more marginalized in accessing healthcare because people are adopting technological advances that are not accessible to them. Back to you, Naina. Thank you so much for kicking us off, um, Alan. That was really a great opening and very powerful. and. Um, for those who aren't familiar with um, with Alan Maleche's work, we'll drop some links for you into the chat to check it out. There's um, um, Alan has really led an important body of work around data privacy, consent, and also looking at resistance to these kinds of technologies. And you know, some of what I what I heard from you. Um, is is really the importance of um, if our goal is to enhance access to healthcare, how do these technologies move us forward towards there, or and or how is there attention around how these technologies are actually exacerbating inequities? In fact, um, we need to be clear that technology and data may bring advantages, but they are not neutral, um, right? So. Technology is never is never neutral. Um, technology is developed inside of a racist white supremacist system that is also cis heteropatriarchal, and um, so communities. Um, communities that are LGBTQ, um, communities of color, migrants, and I know we'll talk a lot more about this <clears throat> throughout the conversation, um, we really need to be mindful of ways that these technologies can exacerbate racism and discrimination. And then we're specifically talking about um, people who are policed based on health status, um, whether we're talking about HIV or uh, sexual and reproductive freedom. Um, and in fact, there are growing trends to, to police these communities. So, um, and common ideologies that maybe are undergirding how technologies are deployed, how surveillance is deployed, and um, how how folks are criminalized. So thank you for really leading us off with such a powerful opening. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Alex McClelland, um, 
who again, as I said, is the assistant professor at the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Carleton University in Canada, um, who's going to be talking to us um, more specifically about a specific technology, molecular HIV surveillance, and how it relates to um, how, how it's been used, how it's been deployed, and also how um, there may be contestation around privacy, bodily autonomy, and consent. I'll turn it over to you, Alex. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nina. And uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, wonderful world's words. Uh, your work is always so inspiring to me, and uh, I love the work of Kellen. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you to Jen, Jim and the Choice Agenda, and also Kelly and PWN. Um, I come to this conversation as someone living with HIV and someone who works uh, in criminology and also as an activist responding to it, the context of criminalization of people living with HIV in my country in Canada. I'm in unceded Algonquin territory, which is known colonially as Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Um, and uh, I am going to try and share some slides with you. Let's see if it works. Also loved the playlist. That was a really great way to start a conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, is that working? Can people yes. see the slide? Yes. Yep. Okay, awesome. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I know that Choice Agenda has held a conversation on molecular HIV surveillance before. So I'm going to um, do a quick overview of things, but if anyone has clarifications or hasn't heard of this technology and wants to know more, please use the chat. Um, please reach out to me at any time. Um, I'm very happy to, not during my presentation exactly, but afterwards, very happy to engage um, and chat with you and give you more information about uh, what I'm talking about if I skip over things too quickly. But I just want to make sure that we get a lot of time for conversation. So I'm going to go through things a bit quickly. I wanted to situate the conversation on molecular HIV surveillance and also our discussion today on reproductive health. First, by kind of defining uh, two terms that are really key and really important for us in relation to our work on this, which is bodily integrity and bodily autonomy. So bodily integrity essentially has, is that you have the right to not have your body or aspects of your body interfered with without your consent. So you're free from physical interference in relation to your body. Um, bodily autonomy um, is essentially that you have the right to make decisions about what happens with your body. Um, and so those are two different things. One is about the physical aspects of your body. One is about the right to make decisions about your body. And so we're thinking about these two different concepts in our conversation today around forms of surveillance, which might uh, in the context of molecular surveillance is dealing with our blood. So it actually takes part of our body away without our consent and our, our bodily autonomy where we um, don't have don't consent to things happening. Um, and also just to situate informed consent for people, um, this again is the right to make decisions about um, what forms of treatment we might access. Um, and it also outlines a duty for providers, healthcare providers, um, to in, inform us of things that are going to happen to our body so that we can make a decision to agree to participate. Um, and this thing puts both bodily autonomy and bodily integrity together, depending on um, the context. And one of the things to outline is informed consent just isn't here because it's an ethical thing that uh, emerged out of nowhere. It actually emerged out a lot of out a lot of exploitation and fights against people's rights. Um, and various different violations that have occurred in many different countries around the world. In my country specifically, it's related to the forced sterilization of Indigenous women um, and coerced sterilization of Indigenous women, tests against Indigenous people, testing malnutrition in so-called residential schools in the process of which is ongoing colonization, but this was many years ago. And so these concepts of informed consent are rooted in exploitation and then rooted in uh, systems um, exploiting marginalized populations. So they exist as a, as a mechanism now for us to hold these systems to account. <clears throat> um, and it's also important for people to know there's many people from around the world in this conversation today. Bodily autonomy and bodily integrity are enshrined in Western conceptions of medical ethics and research.
church ethics and also in specific laws in your country. Depending on your country, bodily autonomy or integrity may be a component of your constitution, um, may be aspects of privacy law. So important to understand those. Where does that lie? Where does that obligation lie? Um, also important for us to know that uh, bodily autonomy um, might be an integrity, might be at odds with certain public health principles and practices where individuals' rights are suspended for the rights of everybody. And when talking about this, it's important. I always think of the work of Gary Kinsman, a leading Canadian HIV activist, who always says when we talk about public health, we have to talk about who's public who is the public and public health, and whose health are we talking about? And so often the rights of certain marginalized people, the rights of people living with HIV can be suspended for this greater uh, conception of public, the public, um, which excludes marginalized people from being part of the public. And so it's always important for us to hold that kind of idea to account when we think of what's the public or what's public health, who is the public and public health and whose health are we actually talking about? Is that is conceptions of public health actually supporting the rights of people who are most marginalized? And if they aren't, we have to ask questions as to why. Um, so this will be a really quick and dirty overview of molecular HIV surveillance, which is an issue I've been working on for quite a number of years, which is concerning has been concerning to me as someone who lives in a context of uh, multiple forms of criminalization existing. Criminalization against people living with HIV, criminalization of people who use drugs, criminalization of migration, criminalization of people who sell sex and who buy sex. Um, and molecular HIV surveillance is a certain form of surveillance which examines the molecules in people living with HIV's blood um, and collects those molecules in a context of care. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll explain more in my next slide. But here's a really great uh, um, uh, uh, activist piece of, um, um, an activist uh, image that was created by Positive Women's Network outlining that people are not clusters in molecular HIV surveillance. People talk about clusters defining us in relation to clusters. Um, and there's been lots of activism highlighting that people are not clusters and that we are more than just molecules. Uh, molecular HIV surveillance highlights what um, Naina mentioned in the beginning, that data is not benign and we have to be conscious of the ways in which data must be may, can be weaponized. I also want to underline, and I think it's really important, the thing that Alan said at the beginning, that the technology itself um, might be something that could be very useful and beneficial for people, but it's when it's deployed in a context where we are not being protected and we are being surveilled and criminalized that we have to have quest raised questions. So again, the technology behind molecular HIV surveillance, if presented in collaboration or developed in collaboration with people, with communities who are most at risk of being surveilled and criminalized, could, be, could provide some benefits. Um, and so I don't wanna be a total Debbie Downer about it, but we have to think about the context in which, te uh, with tech in which technologies are deployed. And so molecular HIV surveillance starts with the blood of people living with HIV. I go and get my blood work done for my own care, or I go get an HIV test, um, that, a confirmatory HIV test, and um, an extra vial of blood is taken and shared with public health. Um, that vial of, can be in certain contexts, um, depending on where you live. Um, that information is then uh, that blood is then collected, not for your own clinical care, but is compared against others um, to determine if there's rapid HIV tests happening in other places, comparing the genetic sequence of your blood, not for the purposes of your care, but to actually understand the context of criminal, of context of surveillance happening in, or the context of HIV transmissions happening in your country and region. Um, it's important to note that most often it's done without consent, so people aren't aware that their blood is being used um, in this context. Um, and uh, so uh, that's where informed consent and questions about bodily autonomy and bodily integrity come in. Um, to be meaningful, um, sources of uh, genetic sequences of people's blood are compared with lots of different other information. Um, and so uh, they are aggregated with information about who you are, where you live, what kind of sex you have, if you have sex work history, if you use drugs. And so lots of information is collected about people, which is a concern. Um, it is being widely used in many countries around the world. It's actively being deployed in many, many states across the US. It's being used in many African countries. 
in Nigeria, for example, um, USAID funding has mandated that Nigeria develop a nationwide molecular surveillance system. And um, interestingly, when examining literature published on this issue, um, uh, researchers are most interested in those which are considered, populations considered hard to reach, migrants, uh, people who use drugs, trans people. So there's a lot of literature um, highlighting specific studies, examining um, uh, examining genetic sequences of these populations to highlight certain clusters in certain countries that are transmitted and, and move people moving across borders. Um, often those papers or don't don't discuss the the political context, the context of criminalization, the context of surveillance. They study people as objects and vectors of disease more primarily. Really quickly, um, I have two more slides to talk about this, and that um, that the concerns raised about this this type of technology are that there is no informed consent. There could be intensified stigmatization of communities. There's one uh, interesting case, or not so interesting, but terrifying case in Kenya where there was a molecular HIV surveillance study done, and academics published a journal article about it. That journal article was then taken up in the media promoting homophobic sentiments about men, men who have sex with men in Kenya, um, driving stigmatization of people in that country. Um, in, in the US, we've had clusters of people living with HIV published in the newspaper, um, including uh, people's addresses um, or the street that people were on. Um, and here's a range of other concerns that exist around this. Um, I just wanted to also highlight a context just from my country that it's very, might be important for people to know. Um, and this is separate from the actual practice of molecular HIV surveillance, but this is the context in which this technology could be deployed and is being deployed. And one of these is a newspaper article about a man in Vancouver who was allegedly not taking his HIV medication, so he was virally unsuppressed. And the public health authorities worked in collaboration to, with police to undertake a um, a uh, manhunt against this person. Um, and the other one you can see is uh, Edmonton case uh, where a sex worker, a trans sex worker, his viral load was indicated as being very high. In Canada, we charge people uh, with uh, aggravated sexual assault if they're alleged to not tell someone else they have HIV. So we see information about people's viral load being reported to the media um, through the police. And so this is an intersection of information being shared in a context um, that is damaging for people living with HIV. And very lastly, and I'll, I think we'll just share this link, I, I undertook a study of molecular HIV surveillance um, publications around the world, um, and we put together a series of reports on behalf of Positive Women's Network and the HIV Justice Network, and these are to uh, take our concerns seriously, address and respect the bodily autonomy and integrity of people living with HIV, and a series of other ones which I'll let people um, look at on their own and Thank you so much. I'll pass it on to our next speaker. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, for that um, wonderful outlining. I do want to confirm that we're seeing the questions that are coming in in the chat and also the Q&A. We're tracking those and we'll um, address those when we get to our discussion section and Q&A. So keep them coming. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thanks, Alex, for really outlining, you know, a little bit of what molecular HIV surveillance is, some of the concerns that have been uplifted around it, and also helping to connect these dots on informed consent. I think this also harkens back to what Alan was talking about. Um, we're really talking about technologies, data practices that both individuals and communities have not consented to um, that are being deployed on our on our communities. And so um that I think that thread will continue um, as we um, as we hear from our next speaker, um, Arnita Rogers, who is the executive director at the Center for Reproductive Rights and Justice at UC Berkeley. Um, and Arnita is going to be talking to us about what's going on with criminalization of pregnancy, criminalization of reproductive freedom particularly in the US context. And um, as, as we know, um, you know, Roe versus Wade fell a couple of years ago, 
But that um, the fall of Roe v. Wade was really the result of 50 years of organizing by um, by the far right to undermine reproductive freedoms and um, what we see in terms of surveillance and criminalization and policing of reproductive health and bodily autonomy is not disconnected from um, attacks on, uh, you know, on gender identity and sexual orientation and communities impacted by HIV. And so we're, um, we want to really think about the connections between criminalization of, um, of pregnancy and abortion access and um, how how communities are resisting that and how that's connected to this struggle for bodily autonomy in the context of HIV. So I'll turn it over to you, Arnita, to take it away. Sorry, can folks... Can folks see my my screen? Yes, although we're seeing the presenter view. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, oh. we're seeing the speaker notes. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that, y'all. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Arnita Rogers. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm joining y'all from Ohlone land, occupied Ohlone land, also um, known as Oakland. Um, so thank you uh, to the Choice Agenda and PWN Kellen for hosting this really timely discussion um, and um, for Nana for the, for the introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to be switching gears a little bit to talk about the criminalization of um, of pregnancy and abortion and re reproduction, reproductive decision making as it relates to surveillance and some of the topics that Alex mentioned around bodily autonomy and bodily integrity. But I thought that I would, um, I want to start us off by grounding us in a conversation about um, reproductive justice and rooting this this discussion in reproductive justice. So. Um, Reproductive justice is defined by Sister Song as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. And so um, I really want to ground us in that framework of reproductive justice as a place of sharing whatever our affirmative vision of bodily autonomy and self-determination can be while we're addressing issues of criminalization and surveillance of our bodies as really intersectional issues. Um, so reproductive justice is a framework was is a is a framework and a movement that was developed by black women and women of color and that asks us to analyze um, systems of power and intersection intersecting oppressions that center the most marginalized of the folks that we're talking about that are targeted by criminalization and surveillance of black people, people of color, people with low incomes, LGBTQ people, migrants. Um, people living with HIV, people with disabilities, and other folks who are facing barriers to accessing to reproductive and sexual health care, um, and face that right to face barriers to the right to bodily autonomy and discrimination. So those same communities are most impacted by criminalization and surveillance during pregnancy and for the reproductive outcomes and also for the ways that they decide to form their families. So um, as Nana was mentioning in June of 2022, um, a couple of years ago, in a case called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health and the US, the US Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade um, overruling a 1973 court decision that held that um, because the US constitution guaranteed a right to privacy, it also guaranteed people with the capacity for pregnancy with the right to obtain abortion prior to viability. Um, so the impact of Roe was to set a federal baseline that every person had the right to end their pregnancy um, and subs subsequent cases, you know, started to diminish that right, but um, it was eventually overturned by Dobbs. So with Dobbs, the Supreme Court not only, you know, ended the right to abortion, but it called into right the very right to privacy itself, um, saying that the word privacy was never mentioned in the Constitution 
And in doing so, it also come to call into question the very part of, you know, the U.S. legal foundation that underlines our right to access contraception, the right to marriage, and many other parts, the right to sexual intimacy, other parts of our int intimate lives. And so now in this post-Dobbs landscape, we have a landscape now where um, 14 states now um, completely ban abortion in almost all circumstances, eight others restrict it further um, than they did prior to Dobbs, the Dobbs decision. And a little over a week ago, Florida became the latest state to allow a near total six week abortion ban in place, um, which will of course have devastating and dire consequences for not only the people seeking care in Florida, which is one of the most populous states in um, the US, but also to the, the thousands of other people that have been traveling to the state to seek care from southern states where abortion has already been banned. So if you look at the map, you can see that um, some states like California, where I live and work to expand access to um, abortion care while, and, and protect the status quo while others you know, have made those restrictions and Florida, Florida, Florida voters will actually have an opportunity to um, to take this issue of abortion access to their, their ballot to see if they can actually enshrine it in their constitution coming up in, in November. And um, every time that it's been put on the ballot um, that's been successful and voters in, in the United States have, have voted for that. Um, but also in looking at the map, there's no coincidence that many of the states that now ban abortion have some of the highest mater maternal mortality rates and also have some of the highest rates of pregnancy criminalization. And I bet if you look at the map, there's a, there's a lot of overlap in the places that also criminalize HIV. Um, so the session, the Supreme Court session um, had, we already heard one um, case, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus FDA that would have, would severely restrict access to medication abortion. And there's another case that will be heard in a couple of weeks on, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, um, which is a federal law that guarantees the right to um, emergency abortion care. Um, both cases, if they are decided in favor of anti-abortion extremists, would severely um, limit access to care and also um, increase the threat to, of criminalization and surveillance of people that are seeking care. So um, the proliferation of abortion bans um, since the fall row wasn't the start of, of um, the criminalization of, of, of pregnancy. So people have long been charged with crimes alleged to pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. Um, but with the post row landscape in America, it will only happen more frequently especially to people with color, especially to people with low incomes, people who use drugs and other marginalized communities. Um, they will face um, criminal charges ranging from child neglect to endangerment to manslaughter to even homicide. So as defined by Pregnancy Justice, which is a leading legal and civil rights, human rights organization in the US fighting criminalization, punishment and surveillance of pregnant people in the US, Pregnancy criminalization occurs when someone is arrested for reasons related to their pregnancy or um, where the terms of their bail, their sentencing or probation are heightened because they are pregnant. Um, and so um, pregnancy justice has looked deeply into um, instances of criminalization over several years, over the past couple of decades. And in the 16 years prior to Dobbs, they cited 1,400 cases of pregnancy criminalization um, and um, more interesting, like more interesting, is that um, the majority of the pregnancy criminalization cases happen in just a handful of southern states, um, with most of them occurring in the state of Alabama. Um, and in some of those states, um, Alabama, South Carolina, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Mississippi are, of course, places where HIV is also criminalized. criminalized. And so while much attention has really been paid to um, the increased threat of abortion criminalization, those cases, even now in this post-Dobbs landscapes are still exceedingly rare, 
but people who uh, use drugs have been um, overwhelmingly um, and, um, targeted for surveillance and criminalization. So the fetal personhood movement um, has really given rise to pregnancy criminalization. Um, and it is a radical concept um, that is based on the idea that life begins at conception and has really been kind of enshrined in anti-abortion laws. Um, these laws really kind of came into mainstream attention recently when an Alabama Supreme Court ruled that embryos should be treated as minor children under the law and temporarily halted H um, IVF. Um, treatment, um, assisted reproductive technology in the state for the fear of providers being charged criminally and civilly. Um, fetal personhood laws also um, grew in ascendance with the war on drugs and the mor moral panic around the so-called crack babies um, and uh, babies growing up, um, you know, the fear of outcomes for children that are growing up as as crack babies. And so, um, you know, at this time, there was a widespread fear of, of a prenatal use of drugs. And, um, you know, there was a narrative that was fed on moral tropes um, that scapegoated really black women, mainly poor black women who use drugs. Um, and so, you know, fetal personhood paves the way for more surveillance and punishment of pregnant people. And it also, you know, has provided a rational basis for um, drug testing without informed consent and entangles healthcare providers with state and law enforcement and captures family into the family's policing system. Time. Um, and so, um, with all these these ways, there are, you know, um, with all these threats of criminalization and the entanglement of uh, providers with law enforcement, there are ways that communities are beginning to resist, um, you know, and I think there's work for us to do. And I think we're going to talk about more about how we can, um, you know, break up with, break up public health from our, you know, relationship, I won't say our relationship, but the relationship that public health has with, with law enforcement, how can we disentangle it? Um, hospitals often report pregnancy outcomes when there are no legal requirements that exist to do so. Um, and pregnancy justice in their examination of pregnancy criminalization found that one in three instances of pregnancy criminalization um, have been initiated by healthcare providers. Um, so there's so much work to do in organizing healthcare providers and thinking about the ways that um, it's so harmful um, to entangle with law enforcement. Um, this moment in um, you know, the post dogs landscape of the threat of criminalization has really garnered a lot of tension around um, making sure that abortion seekers, patients, and providers can um, safely get care and how do they protect their digital privacy. And so there are organizations like the Digital Defense Fund that are, you know, creating zines and helpful guidance on um, how to safely search for abortion care um, and how people can travel to get care in states where care is still legal. There's policy movement to, um, you know, create shield laws that are providing, um, you know, protections for people, you know, doing telehealth care in different states, and also um, abortion funds who have always been a site of um, organizing and um, providing what we call practical support, the other type, not actual health care, but the support people need to get the care that they need, transportation, funding, other types of care, have also become um, a really um, a place of organizing and information sharing for, um, you know, fighting back against um, surveillance and, and, and ways to people, ways to help people keep ourselves safe when, when seeking care. And so I will, I'll turn it over. I think Nana is going to take us into um, another conversation. Yes. Um, and thanks so much, Arnita. Um, I think that 
that visual overlay, you know, looking at how we're really talking about the same folks when we're thinking about policing and surveillance of these different issues from um, criminalization of HIV to which geographic areas actually bear a high bur burden of HIV rates um, in the same places where we're seeing, um, you know, really invasive use of um, surveillance and policing and laws targeting abortion seekers and people who are pregnant and um, high rates of prosecutions of people who are pregnant um, unrelated to abortion access as well. Um, and particularly, again, you know, targeting BIPOC communities, LGBTQ communities. So thanks for uplifting that. Um, for all of our panelists, um, I think, you know, drew some made some references to um, both like communities that are most impacted and also different ways that um, individuals and communities can organize. And I'd love to hear each of you speak a little bit to examples of resistance you're seeing in the spaces you're working in, um, and particularly any examples of resistance to these technologies or um, invasive data privacy practices that are you're excited about um, and that you think are making some incursions. So I'll turn it over to our panelists to um, offer us some reflections on that first. Sure, I'm happy to go first and I'll draw on two examples in Kenya. I will share a report in the link once I finish the intervention, but it's around the example I gave of uh, two large funders in the HIV world trying to drive the use of biometrics. And so Kellyn working closely with the key populations consortium in Kenya, with Privacy International, uh, quickly undertook a study to try and document the views and concerns that key populations had about rolling out a biometric system without getting their consent, without consulting them. And they were able to put together a report that we called Everybody Said No, that documented the concerns they had, outlining the demands they had to the donors, to the government, and also being able to ensure that uh, they are able to address the issues. And so this report was highly publicized and uh, they got the donors and partners into a meeting. And uh, as a result of that, there was a stalling of the process and it now could not go ahead until they were consulted. The second way I have seen this being addressed is with regards to people taking, it's with regards to people taking into account the issue of litigation. We have supported a number of cases before the High Court of Kenya, particularly where there is uh, an effort to collect biometric data of uh, people living with HIV or just general data. We had a case in Kenya where the president wanted a list of all people who are living with HIV on a public database. And so again, I will share that case, but again, that shows the use of the law and litigation. And then lastly, is working a lot with the affected communities to know what are the issues, how do they approach them, who do they push as a stakeholder, and who do they hold accountable in order to ensure that such technologies are not pushed forward without their consent, without their participation, and without their involvement. Over. Thanks, Alan. I can go next. Um, I think um, uh, there's a number of things flowing around in my head, and um, uh, one of them is in terms of resistance. Um, there's been a very active movement of resistance in North America, specifically in the U.S., um, led by people living with HIV resisting molecular HIV surveillance. Um, and so there was uh, the letter that Nana was part of uh, to the Center for Disease Control calling for a moratorium on molecular HIV surveillance until people living with HIV uh, were consulted and engaged. Um, and until there was consent mobilized and, to, and until there was guaranteed safeguards around people's data provided. Um, that moratorium actually was really successful uh, because it got it the attention of researchers who were using um, data garnered from public health without consent, because this is what happens in molecular HIV surveillance pro projects 
is public health authorities gather all this data without consent and then they hand it over to researchers and researchers actually have more a different ethical duties around uh, collecting using data specifically around consent um, they have to get use data with informed consent and so um in most cases. Um, and so uh, there was researchers who decided to halt uh, a National Institutes of Health research uh, funded project. Um, when the moratorium came out, they stopped their research project because they thought um, we should actually address these concerns and take them seriously. And so they stopped the project and they wrote about the project. Um, the, the, the idea of consulting communities and what it meant to stop their analysis. And their analysis was actually looking at very kind of potentially harmful and racist framings of, of black gay men as being vectors of risk. Um, and they wrote about the community concerns and thanks for sharing the paper, um, Kelly, uh, community concerns around that. So we see directly that resistance from people living with HIV and calling attention to these issues can, uh, uh, can have an impact. I think the other thing that um, I'm inspired by specifically in this conversation is just solidarity across movements where um, bodily autonomy is being infringed upon and, uh, and under attack. And this is happening in a whole bunch of different ways um, around in Canada, specifically around um, trans people's rights to access health care, around people who use drugs, right to use drugs, um, around people to people's ability to access reproductive health care and abortion and people living with HIV. Um, so all of these movements working together, I think, and having these conversations and solidarity can really uh, have an impact. And when we focus on and understand that it's bodily autonomy under attack and marginalized people's bodily autonomy that's under attack from various different reasons that we can have a broader impact across our communities. I'll hand it over to Arnitra. Alex, um, yeah, I would just echo, I think that the solidarity across movements and learning lessons across movements has been, um, gaining steam in the reproductive justice movement and, and learning from communities that have um, been under surveillance, immigrant communities, sex workers who have had to seek care, um, you know, further to the margins um, for a longer time, so I think has been a big development. And um, and also getting back to the point I was talking about, just um, working, you know, healthcare providers have been such a big part of the reproductive justice movement, but have not always necessarily, maybe not all have had the analysis that, you know, you don't have to be entangled with law enforcement. More and more people are managing their own abortions and um, that's only going to increase with the, you know, in a post-ops landscape. And I think there's still a lot of educating and organizing to do with healthcare workers and providers. It's been a lot of really vocal and outspoken folks that are leading that way, but I think there's a lot of work that is still needs to do to, to resist. Yeah. Um, thank you all for those uh, those great examples and helping us think also, I think, expansively about pressure points and leverage points for resistance and different kinds of targets that um, that we might engage from, um, you know, from providers to um, to to researchers and other types of targets as well in terms of thinking about resistance. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in on the chat or the Q&A, and we're going to start addressing some of those. I also want to remind folks that if you'd like to come off mute and ask a question in real time, feel free to raise your hand and we will bring you on video um, to ask your question as well. So um, let's start with, I think, one question that kind of came up from um, from Catherine Hansen's. Um, in the chat uh, was basically considering the significant harms that the speakers have already identified. Why do you think there is so little resistance from the HIV and privacy communities and networks to HIV testing bills that would allow testing people without even verbal notice that they're about to be tested for HIV, such as the proposal pending in New York? Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with that particular uh, proposal. Um, if you are, feel free to speak to that directly, or if not, maybe more generally to that question of um, why why aren't we seeing resistance in some corners around some of these incursions um, into data privacy? Um, I can go. Um, um, 
I don't actually have an answer necessarily, but like there has been lots of debates. I mean, it's interesting to think back around how HIV testing, there was many, many fights around HIV testing being anonymous earlier on in the epidemic um, and uh, led by people living with HIV and really concerns about registries of people living with HIV being documented. And then, I mean, in Canada, um, a new HIV test is always, you, public health authorities have to legally report that. Um, and then people's uh, people's name is on an, a list and their tests are on a list um, so that public health can keep track of everybody. Um, and uh, usually, or it's, there has been the case where people go for anonymous testing, you just get a number associated with your test. Um, and then if you get a confirmatory test, then you end up on the public health record. They know about you because uh, you have to get it nominally. nominally. Um, and there has been now this rollout of getting HIV tests or HIV tests happening without people's consent in emergency rooms, um, primarily when actually, uh, and often when um, people are going to give birth. Um, and so uh, there's this uh, kind of rollout that's happening specifically in BC, which is the leading province around rolling out molecular HIV surveillance, because the larger picture they have of, of people who have tested, the better they can use these technologies. The bigger the picture they have of people in terms of all of the tests, the better the technology works to infer which kind of clusters exist. I don't have an answer as to why there hasn't been more resistance, uh, because our movement used to be rooted really in privacy, rights to privacy, rights to bodily autonomy, and those have just been slowly chipped away and eroded. And I'm really glad that we're talking about it more, but I don't really have an answer as to why people aren't more concerned. And um, I hope that this crew of many people on this call might have an answer to that. Does anyone else, um, and any of other speakers want to address this question? Elder Antoinette Etienne from New York. Hi, Nana, how you doing, baby? Hey, Elder, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Did you want to speak to this question as well? Yes, I do, because awesome. we recently- can, can you Could you also introduce yourself a little bit more? Oh. I am Elder Reverend Antoinette Etienne, the New York City co-chair for New York State. Uh, been with PWN for a while, been an activist for over 37 years and was testing for HIV when it was by the blood. And then we had to wait anywhere from four to six to eight weeks. So I've been in this field for a while. Um, why there's been resistance in New York? Because they did not have the knowledge. It wasn't brought to New Yorkers. I recently found out about it and I'm always being nosy about something and excuse my attire, but my sinus is acting up. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we didn't have the knowledge, but we got the knowledge now. We've met with PWN, um, Antoinette Jones, our regional director, myself, and CHLP have met. They've given me the flyers. They've given me the bill. We've had two sessions, March 16th and March 29th, which were both National Women and Girls Day, where our attendees were informed about it. Um, there was a lot of questions. I have just recently requested another meeting and sent it out to everybody that I know in New York City um, to learn about this bill and get on to stop it. First of all, why would you, I have a problem with somebody taking something away from me and I don't know about it. If you ask me, I'll give it to you, but don't take it from me. Um, Another thing too, we have a lot of immigrants here. They don't have the knowledge. So after you take a test and they're positive and they don't have an address or don't know what kind of medication they're gonna take, what are we gonna do? So this surveillance thing is like a tracking and I don't like to be tracked, but that's my personal stuff. But it's a tracking of individuals that don't have the knowledge of what's going on. Our population here in New York needs to be educated some more. I am fanatical about getting the information out. And like I said, the from GMHC to Housing Works to Vocal, they've all been notified and we need a meeting so we can get on this ASAP. And um, that's why <clears throat> the resistance has been low because we didn't know. Thank you kindly and let me get off. Thank I you mean, so I'm not much. getting off, I'm just <laughs> finished. <laughs> Yeah, don't leave us. That was um, that was powerful. Thank you so much for sharing those insights, Elder. And I think um, 
you know, the, the perspective that you're sharing with us in response to that excellent question that was raised, I think really parallels a lot of what we've seen around even the rollout of molecular HIV surveillance at a national level in the United States, um, you know, where, um, uh, CDC and other stakeholders kind of allege that they had consulted with the community. And I think this goes back to Alan's work and Alan's report, right? Also, everyone said no. Um, everyone said no, and they just kept rolling and steamrolling ahead. And um, in the when when molecular HIV surveillance was integrated fully into CDC funding in PS 181802, um, which is a federal funding announcement that came out from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in um, for funding for jurisdictions starting in 2018, um, but basically mandated inclusion of molecular HIV surveillance and what they call cluster detection and reporting as part of HIV prevention activities. Um, you know, they kind of alleged that they had done a lot of community consultation. But when we looked at the list of who they had talked to, um, I, out of like 50 people on a report, there were two people living with HIV and neither of them were involved with organized formations of people living with HIV. So, um, so there's a question of like accountability and who is talked to, who even knows that um, this is happening. And then it's, it's really unsurprising that um, groups, stakeholders who have power in various ways, whether it's through their um, their funding contracts, their relationships are generally not reflective at the highest levels of leadership of the communities that they are serving. And so um, aren't always sharing the same interests as far as human rights and privacy protections. And this also, you know, I think very much harkens back to how um, the discourse around you equals you took so long to be taken up in any kind of um, formal ways um, where providers and public public health quote experts were saying on and off the record, people living with HIV can't be trusted with this information was basically the bottom line, right? People living with HIV cannot be trusted to um, make, uh, you know, to make responsible decisions. Um, black people, people of color, communities of color, queer folks, trans folks cannot be trusted um, and so have to be policed and surveilled in these types of ways. Um, and women cannot be trusted um, to make decisions about their bodies. And so this is a common ideology and narrative that really drives a lot of um, a lot of policy making and um and it's not it's that that ideology is not narrative from the institutions that are purporting to serve people living with HIV and people of reproductive potential either so um so i think that you know it the I think that what we're hearing and what we heard from Elder and what we're hearing from um, Alan's work and others is the importance of really robust and meaningful engagement of directly impacted communities throughout all aspects of these processes of designing technology, of um, thinking about implementation of these technologies and, um, and data use practices and what they will look like. Um, anyone want to, from our panel want to add anything on that, or I'm going to move on to some of these other questions? Okay, so um, there are a couple of very specific questions that we'll get to in a minute, but I also want to um, look at some of these big picture questions, um, like this one from Kay. Greenberg at CHLP. Um, any thoughts on how to make sure that the quote public in public health includes everyone and centers the needs of the most marginalized without drifting into the kind of focus on the individual and privacy rights that underpin the anti-choice movement? So basically, um, how do we look at, um, you know, not getting into um, these, these points of tension between individual rights versus public health rights? And what, do, what does this really mean from like a, a broad-based rights perspective?
I can go first if, so, if you want. No, go, go, go ahead, Alan. Alex. No, Alan, you no, go, go for, for it. it. Go for it. So I think it's always a challenge where people talk about balancing individual rights versus public health rights. But you must realize for public health to succeed, you must get the trust of the individual. And so to get the trust of the individual, you must respect their rights to give them information. You must guarantee them privacy of their information, especially when you're dealing with vulnerable or marginalized groups or criminalized groups. And where you have a situation where their data is breached, they need to find a way to be able to get redress. So you can try your best to promote testing as a result of trying to know how many people have HIV or to provide treatment with them. But if you force, if you coerce, and if you don't give people information around why it's important to test, no one will show up and your public health goal will be defeated. And so those who seek to advance public health must underpin it with human rights. And human rights requires that you inform people, you respect, and you provide safeguards in case something goes wrong. So for me, I hold, and from the experience that I've had over years is, unless you promote human rights, you're not going to succeed in your public health outcomes. We saw it in COVID, we've seen it in the HIV response, we've seen it in the TB response, and everyone is coming back to see that whether you're working with a person who is affected, who's at risk, who's infected, you must put them at the center of the response and you must tailor that public health response towards their particular needs, otherwise it will not work. Many have tried, many have tried to do partner notification, many have tried to force people to bring their partners, many have tried to cause others to, to test, but it all ends up failing and you lose on that public health outcome. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Alan. I know we have a hand up as well, too, so I'll, do, I'll be quick because I'd rather have other people participate. Um, but I think uh, public health, there is no one unified public health ethics framework. It's different in different places and it can change over time. And the a lot of the people who are, are uh, public health people who have responded or public health or practitioners of people doing molecular HIV surveillance who have responded to concerns from people living with HIV provide us with outdated uh, citations uh, justifying public health surveillance without consent that don't align with the contemporary context of big data, the ways in which our data is used in the context of technology. They're using outdated uh, ethics frameworks that don't account for technology today and how, th how the practices that are taking place. So public health ethical frameworks need to be adapted and we need to push public health practitioners to adapt those ethics frameworks to account for the technology that's being used today. And exactly what Alan said, public health, in order to be um, a trusted institution, has to be, we, we have to trust them. Um, in order to in establish institutions where, which um, uh, big up or amplify people's health and health, out, health outcomes, trust needs to be at the center of it. And I think we can build one public health um, uh, ethical principle that exists is transparency. Um, often public health institutions aren't very transparent. We actually don't know what's happening or where people's blood is going or what's happening with it or how it's being stored or taken care of. Um, and so I think I would also appeal to greater transparency, greater collaboration, um, and an actual ethics of trust. I think when Arnitra was talking about how uh, a lot of pregnancy criminalization cases originate with public health or with health practitioners. Um, uh, that also happens in HIV. We have people's health practitioners calling the police on people or public health authorities also calling the police on people. Um, and that's a concern. Like when those actors of the state are acting just as arms of the police, um, that's when we're having a problem. So I think we need to work on trust. Um, and support and actual dignity of people. Like what is it that healthcare, healthcare providers and also public health authorities, they're two different things, but what are they actually doing their work for? Are they doing their work to support people's health outcomes? Or are they doing their work to police people? Thank you. Arnita, did you want to add anything on this? Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, the, the trust piece is, is what's needed because those same things do often happen in the context of reproductive health care, um, where targeting communities, specific communities, often um, based on racist ideologies, um, undermines the public health um, objectives where people um, 
you know, under threat of criminalization or the threat of having their children taken away into the family policing system don't get the care they need. Um, and it's, you know, imperative, especially for pregnancy related care. So I agree. Yeah, thank you. And it's also this, such a false idea, right? Like individual versus the public. Well, who is the public? The public are individuals. So um, this like specter, usually there's some sort of implicit public, um, whether they're like, oh, the public is hetero people <laughs> or the public is white people and they need to be protected from these other individuals. So um, thanks for lifting up that, um, that thread. Um, we have a hand up. Um, I want to invite Ibanolua um, Akinola to come on and share a question or comment. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your yes, name. How you doing? Hi. You would, would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, how y'all doing? Uh, I'm Ibanolua Akinola of uh, 50 Fathers Movement here in Third Ward, Houston, Texas. Uh, we support fathers and families and assist uh, fathers and family unit. Uh, we believe a father should be in the home and we want to equip the youth with empowering their voices and tools with leadership. Um, I wanted to state that a lot of things that we talk about when it comes to data and tracking, but we really don't talk about um, data protection or data security. Uh, right now, we're in the digital era. Uh, AI is about to totally take over. And if we're working alongside with AI, our AI tools should also protect us. Our AI tools should also provide us security measures. Uh, I think we're waiting on someone else to do this uh, when it comes to uh, securing uh, our data. Uh, because if I can look up a certain demographics, I can tell you who's pregnant, who has AIDS, what area they're in, uh, what zip codes they're in. And I can tell you everything, especially when it comes to voting election time. Uh, but we don't know that this is happening with our own data and how it's being collected and how it's being dispersed. So if we could, I say, design some type of device or app or whatever it takes of a tool that says, look, we're going to protect these members' data. This is how it's being used and inform the people of how their data is being used, you know, that will build trust. That, that will build a bridge of trust because right now trust is really a low factor when it comes to our community because we've all experienced a lot of the same things that we've spoke about today. Uh, so for me to elaborate on it, believe me, uh, is, is uh, a miss, but we're all affected by this. Uh, and before it gets out of hand, our data, should be in our hand. So we should have more control, more say so, and more power of how our data is being utilized and dispersed and secured. So that's just a cliff note. I hope I dropped the jewel and I love your pre-Palestine shirt. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think you're really uplifting some very important trends in developments that are happening today and how um, we need to be thinking about being involved. And I'm mindful of time. We do have a lot more questions. Um, any that we don't get to, we will make sure to email out responses to. Jim, does that work okay? Um, it sure does. Okay, great. Because um, I do want to make sure that our panelists have a chance to address anything they might want to say to the um, the speaker who just spoke. And also, I'm going to just drop a couple other um, questions in and kind of like integrate them with this conversation. So what I'm hearing is, you know, a question of like, um, or a recommendation really that like, we need to be um, on top of what's happening with AI and data security and um, and really thinking about that proactively and planning about that proactively. I also see a question from Crystal in the chat that's kind of like, you know, there are Crystal Townsend from P PWN um, in the US who is saying that there are a lot of people living with HIV and people from directly impacted communities involved in community advisory bodies or planning groups, um, you know, in, in various ways. And how can they be involved in helping to um, be active in 
um, in speaking out against these invasive data privacy practices, whether we're talking about molecular HIV surveillance or biometric data or, or uh, the use of artificial intelligence or criminalization of reproductive freedom. Um, so I do want to invite our panelists to speak directly to the, this question of what would you say to, um, you know, to advocates on the ground and folks who are involved in, um, you know, whether like in some kind of service delivery or an organization or in some kind of like community advisory role, um, what would you say in terms of how they can speak out against some of these things and what actions they can take? Um, I can jump in quickly. Um, so uh, to uh, get to the speaker's comments, um, there's two uh, initiatives I would just highlight. Uh, around um, data governance. So I think it's really key. There's lots of debates around data governance and who owns data and how do communities take ownership of data. There's a really great initiative in the US called Data for Black Lives, which is calling for uh, data trusts of people so that like black communities can own data that exists and gen that's generated uh, from their own communities. And in Canada, we have also what's called the OCAP principles, which come from First Nations Indigenous communities, which stand for ownership, possession, access, and control. And those, uh, I can drop links afterwards um, uh, for that one. And that is uh, basically to uh, deal with the ongoing context of colonization where Indigenous people have been over-surveilled by colonizers, colonizers, where have they been a site of extraction of data, but where there's no beneficial outcomes that come back to those communities. So now there's these guidelining, guidelines and principles around how data has to be owned by Indigenous communities, has to be controlled by Indigenous communities, has to they have to possess the actual data, and researchers, they can give it to researchers if they decide to trust those researchers or not. Um, and so I think we also have to look to other models for data governance. We don't just have to rely on the on governments for controlling how data is controlled about our lives. Um, that's one thing. In terms of what to do as a person um, uh, in a on a community board and what to ask for, I think um, I, I we used to always say as a mantra in the HIV response, know your know your HIV epidemic. And I would say know your HIV surveillance system. Understand um, how HIV is being surveilled in your uh, in your community, in your state, in your country. How does the system operate? Um, who's involved with it? Um, what the, what the public health authorities are, and then ask questions about how people living with HIV and how communities are involved in all aspects of that system. And there's uh, in our report. Um, on uh, HIV, or sorry, human rights implications on molecular HIV surveillance. There's a, a series of recommendations we have asking for uh, consent to be provided um, and uh, asking for information to be provided if, if molecular HIV surveillance is happening. One last thing I ask, I would call on um, people who have access to funders, who are talking to funders, to ask for them to fund new and innovative models for consent that uh, can look at various different ways in which people can consent if their information is collected in biobanks and used in, in various ways due to big data. Uh, beyond just standard protocols of informed consent that happens once, there's kinds of dynamic consent, there's authorization consent, but looking at actually investing in forms of understanding consent that can be used so that we can build, build people's trust in these systems. I think Alex has nailed it all. The only thing I would add is to say that for those who sit on boards uh, or on decision-making bodies, uh, whether it's at the community or national or whatever level, I think building solidarity too uh, with other people on the board to help them understand the issues, the challenges you're facing as a person living with HIV or as a woman or as a person of color, I think it's important for you to have those examples and seek solidarity so that you're not the lone voice on the board speaking to the issues, but the others who see the concern and can also collaborate or support or echo what you're saying in terms of pushing back on the harms or the danger of whatever technology is being employed that is not to the best interest of the affected community. Over. 
And in, in terms of the sexual and reproductive health care landscape, I think it's also important to kind of know, know what the laws are in your state or where you live, um, in, in the U.S. context at least, because a part of the issue with the abortion bans and the threat of criminalization is the chilling effect, is that people don't want people to access care when they can actually access care legally. And even if folks can't access care legally in, the, legally in their state, there are still ways that people can manage their own abortions or seek care um, elsewhere um, through you know, the provisions of shield laws and things that I discussed earlier. But it's really important to fight back against misinformation so we don't create a, a chilling effect when people actually can um, have more self-determined outcomes for their care. Yeah, these are um, great tips and resources. And um, so I'm hearing like, you know, look into data governance practices, know your systems, know um, know your rights, like educate yourself about what the actual rights are so you can be part of fighting disinformation. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of thinking about like, what are new models for consent? What does consent really mean? What does it look like? What does it mean for communities to consent as well as for individuals to consent? Um, and how does that get structured in to the process of developing and rolling out um, surveillance? Um, and then, um, you know, also, I think a lot, I've heard a lot of dialogue from our panelists about the importance of solidarity across movements and within movements. And I'm seeing that also reflected in some of the questions we didn't exactly get to. Um, thinking about the links between how um, Black maternal health gets impacted by these um, these types of laws targeting and policing bodies, also like connections between criminalization of choice, criminalization of pregnancy, family surveillance, um, and how, um, you know, how the state interfaces with the bodies and choices of people living with HIV and also of people who, um, who have reproductive potential. Um, in so many different ways in the US and globally. So um, thank you all so much for drawing those connections. Um, I just wanna invite any final closing comments from our panelists, any um, call to action you wanna ask folks here to take. Yes, I will go fast and I would want to say, of course, it's been great having the conversation and uh, seeing all the comments. But I think wherever you are and whatever power you have, I think we must continue to advocate for the inclusion of vulnerable, marginalized voices uh, uh, in the development and implementation of digital innovations uh, so that we ensure their views are taken into account and their concerns are addressed. And for those of you who are based in countries or regions where your government is driving the use of these technologies, where the private sector is driving the use of these technologies in other regions, you need to hold them to account and they need to be held to account where violations uh, happen. Indeed, it's important that we prioritize privacy, security and equity uh, in digital health interventions. And most importantly, they must be safeguards around the data that's collected. And if there's any breach of that, people must have a redress and accountability mechanism in place to hold those who violated their rights accountable. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Great to speak with Arnita um, and Alan and Nana. Thank you for um, what, being our chair and moderator. Um, and there, just the fact that there were so many questions generated and so many people on this call indicates that we need to have more of these conversations. Uh, about the intersections of our work. Like I'm really interested in looking at a map of HIV criminalization in, in the US and the map that you showed, Arnita, um, and talking about the ways in which uh, just forms of criminalization uh, intersect and are targeting the same communities and how we we just need to work more together. Um, so I would call on everyone to just think about that work and solidarity work you can do to support um, either HIV responses or reproductive rights responses, responses together. Um, and thank you uh, just very much to the Choice Agenda and Jim and Kelly for getting us here uh, and PWN. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Just timing quickly to echo what's already been shared. And um, 
reaffirm that abortion is an HIV issue and HIV is also a, a reproductive justice issue. And so, yeah, looking forward to more conversations like this. I've enjoyed this, this intersection. Thank you again so much to our powerful and brilliant speakers, um, to Jim and the Choice Agenda and Kelly at PWN for really pulling this all together. We look forward to continuing to be in conversation with all of you. Um, and we will follow up in um, with an email that has responses to any specific questions we didn't have a chance to get to. Thanks for your patience with us. And we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, back over to you, Jim. Thank you so much. I just want to echo thanks to um, our amazing panelists. The three A's are Anita, Alex, and Alan. So please give them some love in the chat or throw up some emojis. Um, not an A, but still an A, Nana, for wonderful moderation. Thank you to Kellen and PWN USA for co-sponsoring this webinar with the Choice Agenda and AVAC. Um, I will say on behalf of the Choice Agenda, we would certainly be interested in having more of these intersectional discussions. I think to Arnita's point about um, reproductive health care and abortion care is, is completely aligned and completely connected to um, HIV care and so many other things that are not separate. And uh, we would be we would love to continue this conversation. So thank you all so much for having it with us. Thank you to the more than 300 people who registered, the 150 who were with us online. Um, within the day or so, you will get a follow-up email with um, the slides, recording. All of these great resources that have been dropped in the chat will be in a resource document. Um, I know it's very hard to keep up with like 50 million links, so they will all be in a document. You can go back and check those out. Um, we will follow up with any missed questions. Um, please join us for our next webinar on April 26th. And with that said, we're a couple minutes after, so we're basically right on time. I'm gonna close out this call. Thank you all again. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, have a great rest of whatever is left and a great tomorrow. And we hope to see you on more of these calls and have more of these amazing discussions with super smart people. Thanks so much.